As we prepare to receive God's word for us, let us pray for illumination. Prepare our hearts, Holy One, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that, hearing, we may also obey your good and life-giving will. In Christ, amen. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel, according to Mark. One of the legal experts heard their dispute and saw how well Jesus answered them. He came over and asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus replied, the most important one is Israel. Listen, our God is the one Lord and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you will love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. The legal expert said to him, well said, teacher. You have truthfully said that God is one and there is no other besides him. And to love God with all of the heart, a full understanding, and all of one's strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more important than all kinds of entirely burned offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered with wisdom, he said to him, you aren't far from God's kingdom. After that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in each of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week we continue a sermon series where we are following the passages that our young people are learning in Sunday school. In this month of September, the focus is on Jesus' invitation to follow me. Last week with Pastor Adam, we considered what it means to follow the way of Jesus in togetherness as part of a community, as part of co-members of the body of Christ, the church. We considered the origins of what we know as the greatest commandment, to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. This is found in the Torah of the Hebrew scriptures, Torah meaning instruction or teaching. And this is also where we find the Ten Commandments given by God to Moses to give to the Hebrew people, our faith ancestors. With today's gospel reading from Mark, we and our Sunday school kids go deeper into the greatest commandment of God and into Jesus' call to follow as his disciples into the way of God's love. I want to alert you that an illustration in today's sermon, though nothing graphic, does mention gun violence. Our passage today from Mark 12 is situated at the end of a line of questioning from Jesus' opponents, sometimes maybe fans as well, but from the religious leader he encounters in the temple in Jerusalem. The elders, the chief priests, the legal experts or scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. In part, the questions come from awe and wonder at his teachings and the stories of his miraculous healings, but the questions are also rooted in jealousy or fear. They witness in Jesus' power and authority in a new way. It's something different. And they want to know who he is, where does he come from, and from where does his power derive? We remember that at this time in first century Palestine, it's one of a time of great insecurity and uncertainty for the Jewish people as those who are occupied by the tyranny of Rome. Jesus has been causing a stir in the countryside with his teaching and healings. 
He's drawing crowds, all of these things the Roman occupiers hate. And they have no qualms about applying force to squelch them. But here in this passage, we encounter a Jewish religious leader, a legal expert, who's been watching the debates between his fellow leaders and Jesus. And he comes to Jesus with his own question, seemingly without defense, without malice, but rather with some eager amazement. Teacher, he says, which commandment of God is the most important of all? Jesus responds, quoting both Deuteronomy and Leviticus in the Torah, Listen, O Israel, our God is the Most High, one God. And you must love God with all your heart, being, mind, and strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater. I want to recall with you a well-known Bible passage from John chapter 3, often seen on billboards, sports stadiums, along the highway. God so loved the world, it begins, that God sent Jesus into the world not to condemn but to save. And Jesus, so loving God, so loving God's world, loved everyone he encountered. He loved everyone while he lived out his mission statement. And that statement we find in Luke's gospel. It's the account of the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And I invite us to listen to that mission statement because it informs us how we as disciples are called to follow in the way of love. Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth. It's the Sabbath, and as usual, he went into the synagogue. He stood up to read, and the synagogue assistant handed him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. Jesus looked for, and then he read this passage. The Spirit of the Most High God is upon me, because God has anointed me, has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of God's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and explained to the congregation, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. Jesus, in his life, his ministry, embodied for all the world God's grace, forgiveness, justice, healing, compassion, patience, forbearance, and service. He did this for those who called him friends and for those who deemed him an enemy without condition. Jesus loved. And as those called to follow in that way, we may be saying, well, he was Jesus. He wasn't like us. Wasn't he filled to overflowing with the fullness of divine God and love? How can I love that way? And here we remember that learning to live in the way of love, to see everything through the lens of God's love, is just that, a learning. Something we practice throughout our lives. And practice makes progress. God calls us to be faithful practitioners, not perfect. So what does it look like to love God and neighbor as ourselves? The Apostle Paul offers an image I find helpful. He writes in his letters to those early churches, as Christ followers, we are to build up one another in love, never to tear down. So whatever builds up, let us do that. A story I heard this weekend helped paint a picture for me of God's love command. Our Jewish siblings are observing their religious high holy days right now. And tonight begins the holiest of those days, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This is a time of seeking forgiveness from God and others and between one another, a time of reconciliation, a time of drawing closer to God. It's also a time when Jews remember loved ones who have died. Annually, Rabbi Tamar Manasseh, 
who serves a synagogue on the south side of Chicago, offers a Yom Kippur service for her community, specifically for victims of gun violence. The service is not within the walls of a synagogue, but it's on the street corner in their neighborhood, which is fraught with violence. Rabbi Tamar acknowledges that in a place with so many murders, it's hard for the citizens there to experience connection with God and with the loved ones they have lost. This service helps people know that no one is ever beyond redemption. As part of this service, they light candles for every life lost to gun violence in the previous year. Last year, she said it took 45 minutes to read the list of 800 names out loud. She intentionally holds this service on the street corner so that anyone, whether a curious passerby or a member of her synagogue, may feel free to join in or to watch from a distance, to join in lighting a candle or to read the names or to offer a prayer. And Rabbi Tamar remarks that so many people in that neighborhood have experienced such tremendous loss. So many have shared that the very things they do to survive there are things they need or desire forgiveness for. In this service, they are giving an opportunity for an audience with God in a way some of them may have never known. Many are not familiar with Judaism, so this is absolutely life-changing for them. A true gift is given to that community. It strikes me how the love of God and neighbor will be embodied and poured out on that street corner this evening and beyond, offering healing from shame, guilt, grief, sorrow, in ways that only God's love shared one to another can do. Rabbi Tamar, her, Tamar herself is living out her calling as a result of others sharing God's love with her. As an African-American who grew up in a troubled neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, she said, girls like me don't grow up to become rabbis, not from my neighborhood. I've learned that it has to start with others giving black girls and black boys a voice. And Judaism, she said, gave me that voice. She grew up in a Jewish community, and she went to Jewish day school. And there she learned that when there are troubles and problems, not to wait for leaders, whether elected or raised up in the community, to solve their problems. She said to address the societal problems, honestly, it starts with just basic human respect with recognizing the humanity in each person and treating them as such. She said, because when you treat people as human beings, they tend to act more human. She said, I've actually seen gun violence be reduced as a result of introducing Yom Kippur to a neighborhood full of people who feel like they have to have a gun in order to leave their house because they are so afraid people who have shot other people, people who have been shot, to give them this idea that they are not the sum of what they have done in their lives, that they can have a clean slate, that they can start over. She said that makes some people say, you know what, I'm not going to pick up this gun. I don't need it anymore. God empowers us to do our part of God's loving. I hear the love of God and neighbor with such great power in this story to heal and restore and build up, enabling others to do more of the same. I hear how God's love is given and received, and in that exchange, humans become more fully themselves. That is to say, more fully the image of God in which we were created. We have a divine stamp on our lives. So friends, what about us? How are we called as a community of disciples, both here together and out there in the world as we live our lives as a family member, 
a friend, a classmate, a coworker, a member of God's global human family, a member of God's creation, how are we called to live out the great commandment? Christian theologian James Finley remarks that Yo-Yo Ma, the great cellist in an interview, said that when he's playing the cello, he's always very aware that he's not there to prove something. He's there to share something. And Finley says, so everything we have, we have been given and we've been given to give it. Each of us has gifts to share with the world. We are given gifts to do the loving of God in the name and way of Jesus. We may never be a Rabbi Tamar. We may not be speakers of any kind. We may never be a famous athlete or famous at all. We may never make art or write a book. We may be the shyest of introverts or the most energetic extrovert with an audience everywhere we go. But we are all given special gifts from God, large and small and never insignificant. What are yours? How have you experienced sharing of yourself a gift in some way that helped love grow in another? within yourself, your community, or creation. Maybe it's your coming to worship here today and any Sunday where you join in praying with us and singing with us. Maybe you're leading us in song and music. Maybe it's your attending youth group or Sunday school or teaching Sunday school or reading scripture Maybe it's your serving behind the scenes to help big events happen here at Knox, like Knox Rocks or our annual Mission Possible. Maybe you help young people with their schoolwork or give them attention that they don't get at home. Some of you will travel to the U.S.-Mexico border soon to serve asylum seekers in their great need. And the rest of you are invited to join us. We still have room for that on that trip. Some of you will make a meal for someone who is too busy or sick to do so. Some of you will tend to your garden at home or in the community. Some of you pick up litter around the city. Some of you shoulder another's grief by your listening presence, helping the healing because you understand. We are told that after Jesus answered that legal expert's question, no one dared ask Jesus any more questions. And I wonder if it's because when you come to ultimate truth, what else is there to ask? God's love, the first, the last, the eternal truth, abides. Singer-songwriter Jewel sings a refrain in a song that reminds me of this passage. She sings, what's simple is true. I love you. What's simple is true. I love you. This is the sum of the commandments, the gift of the greatest commandment. I love you, God shouts from sea, sky, and land. I love you, universe. I love you, earth. I love you, plants and creatures. I love you, my human family. And to each and every one of us, God says, I love you, my beloved child. Love is who we are because we come from love. And referring back to the Torah, that great book of instruction for our lives in Deuteronomy, we're reminded of God's first and greatest command. This command is not too difficult for you, the author writes, nor is it beyond your reach, far up in the sky or beyond the vastest oceans. No, it is something very near to you, already in your mouths, already in your hearts. You have only to carry it out. This is what Jesus invites us to today, to carry it out 
following him in the way of love. Thanks be to God, our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer. Amen.